right, well, it looks, well, it looks like it's, it's 10 o'clock now, so in order to keep this timely, I'm going to go ahead and kick off the meeting and welcome everyone to the South Atlantic's monthly Third Thursday web forum. Um, on the phone here, you're hearing Lori Barrow, and I serve as the Information Transfer Specialist and Forest Service Liaison to your cooperative. Um, I know most of you are familiar with the forum, but for those of you who may have never joined us before, the South Atlantic LCC hosts this web forum once a month and features a main topic with different presenters. Um, the idea behind the forum is to provide another way of sharing information and generating a conversation about what's going on throughout the region um, and how it's getting done. And as the name implies, it takes place on the third Thursday of each month at 10 a.m. So moving forward. Um, so every forum has roughly the same agenda and format consisting of a brief introduction followed by a 20 to 40 minute presentation on a mission relevant topic. Following the presentation, there will be a block of time to ask presenters questions on the presentation and the remainder of the time will include brief updates and an open discussion about what's going on in your cooperative. Um, how you can get more involved and um, an opportunity that where anyone can ask any questions. So we, the, before we begin, begin the presentation, just a few logistics. I'm going to mute everyone during the presentation so I can, um, so that I ask that if you do have any questions throughout the presentation, you either um, type them directly into the chat box uh, that's available or hold them until after the presentation. And if you do have any questions, all you need to do is press star six to unmute yourself during the block of time set aside for questions and discussion. Now before I mute everyone, does anyone have any uh, questions before we get started? Uh, the conference is now in silent mode. Okay. Great. Well, with that, let's dive right on in with a few staff introductions. Uh, with us today, we have um, uh, several uh, SALCC staff members. We have our coordinator and, sci and science coordinator, Ken McDermott and Rua Mordecai, as well as Miss Amy Keister, our GIF coordinator. And again, I'm Lori Barrow. Um, at uh, what we most days, I think I'm Lori. And um, today we have Greg Moyer uh, as our feature presenter. Um, he's a regional geneticist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and he'll be presenting the results from a project started back in, two, uh, in 2011 um, on the identification of the evolutionary hotspots across the South Atlantic LCC. So at this time, I'll hand the reins over to Greg. And Greg, again, to unmute yourself, you'll need to press star six. And I will pass the ball of power to you, and we can get started. All right, hold on a second. Okay. Um, well, so today, like uh, Lori said, I'm going to be trying to discuss some of the findings um, from our project. Um, that the attempt was to identify some of the evolutionary hotspots in the southeast. Um, I'd like to give some acknowledgments first. Um, primarily, uh, Dr. John Robinson, who was the postdoc on this uh, project, apparently he just, I believe, got a job with South Carolina DNR, so we might be seeing more of him in the near future. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Matt Snyder and Jason Duke from the Regional GIS Center in Cookville, who did a lot of the GIS analysis for us. Um, so just to go into some of the problems, I'd like to just kind of discuss um, some issues. I think we all are aware that, you know, we have a lot of species diversity, biodiversity on this planet, um, but, you know, obviously a lot of humans are rapidly pushing these species towards the brink of extinction. So there's a need to protect this biodiversity. Um, and this is all ever apparent in the southeast. Um, this is a slide of aquatic uh, diversity in terms of the number of fish species. And as you can see in the southeast, um, the number of fish species surpasses that of anywhere else in the United States. Um, the red border indicating the uh, kind of the area of the South Atlantic LCC. Um, but it's also a high level of imperilment for fishes, uh, mussels, um, most of the invertebrate species like crayfish and snails. Um, as you can see here, some of the levels of imperilment um, for fish species, like I said, is also about the same for various other invertebrate species. Yet, when we talk about levels of biodiversity and biodiversity loss, I think most people 
like I just mentioned these last two slides, fixate on species diversity. Um, we, we tend to always gravitate towards species diversity, but one wants to remember that there's also other levels of biodiversity that need conservation and protection. You know, at the top, I think of a pyramid, at the top of that is ecosystem diversity, and the bottom out of the, of the foundation is genetic diversity. And there's been a lot of um, studies recently that show that there is a direct connect between uh, what we find in genetic diversity that um, helps um, promote ecosystem diversity. So it's at that fundamental level of genetic diversity that I am interested in and in, in what's going to be a, a key part of today's talk. Um, just to kind of preface why genetic diversity matters, um, for those that aren't aware, it's required for populations to evolve in response to environmental changes. Um, diverse populations, it's been shown, appear better able to adapt to novel environments, um, often are more resistant to local disturbances, and they've been correlated with primary productivity. So today's talk is going to be, I have two primary goals. Um, I want to determine hotspots of genetic diversity, divergence, or similarity, and we're going to discuss what that all means in a minute, and then try to establish a um, level of protection afforded by these hotspots um, in terms of conservation easements. So w what is an evolutionary hotspot, or what am I defining as an evolutionary hotspot? Um, there are atypical patterns of genetic divergence, uh, genetic diversity, and also genetic similarity across the landscape. Um, where genetic diverse, divergence is reflective of abiotic drivers of adaptive variation. Genetic diversity, which we just discussed, provides populations with a source of evolutionary change. And also genetic similarity, um, there's two rationale here for what could be going on if we see things that are genetically similar. Um, they may reflect relatively recent and rapid range expanses, or they may reflect ongoing high levels of gene flow um, within a, an area. Um, I think it's a no-brainer here that, yeah, the focal area is the South Atlantic LCC that's highlighted in number 14. Um, you know, I, I gave this talk somewhere else, and some people don't know what the LCCs are, so, I, you know, they're applied conservation partnerships. But the real focus, focus of this study and talking with Rue and others was I wanted to try to figure out a way to identify barriers, barriers of migration and identify migration corridors within the South Atlantic LCC. Um, but to do that, we kind of had to do a, a pilot study first to figure out, hey, is it even feasible to do this with genetic data? And so that's kind of the, the rationale for um, this study. Now, as I just kind of mentioned, it's, it's really a pilot study to see if we could actually even identify barriers to gene flow or you know, corridors or things like that. So what we want to do is we want to go in, survey the primary literature, and try to figure out, hey, how many taxa do we have genetic diversity and divergence values for across the South Atlantic LCC? Um, and then we, we're going to take those data and um, do some GIS interpolation and visualiz visualization of those data across the landscape, and then try to do some type of gap analysis to assess the level of biodiversity protection for a given area. So we got into um, the primary literature and found that for um, the terrestrial, we, well, let me back up a minute. We, we want to divide this into two data sets, terrestrial data sets and aquatic data sets, just because each has uh, different um, ways to analyze the data, especially when we're doing interpolation. Um, so with genetic diversity and genetic divergence, we found roughly 15 to 16 terrestrial data sets, which kind of shocked us. We were um, thinking we'd find much less. And then with the aquatic data sets, it was much less, unfortunately, uh, um, especially for genetic divergence, where we only found nine uh, aquatic data sets for genetic divergence. Now, what we did is for um, GIS analysis, we tried to choose data sets that had greater than four unique locations and then within each location, there were three individuals um, per location Those, to estimate genetic diversity and genetic um, divergence values. To give you an idea of our terrestrial data set and the taxa that uh, we found, so this is a table 
Um, we have the species common name and represents um, the collection locality. So there was four, for the mole salamander, there were four collection localities and each one of those localities had greater than three individuals per location. The marker, um, S represents sequence data, M represents microsatellite data, R represents um, re restriction fragment length polymorphism data, and L um, represents allozyme data. It's not really important for the people in the room to understand what those actually mean, um, but would, those are the data sets that we're gonna generate our estimates of um, genetic diversity and genetic divergence. Uh, for the aquatic data sets, um, as you can see here, uh, a, a wide range of taxa involved, and again, um, you know, location, locality information as well as marker information. <clears throat> so I want to point out for the rest of the talk, um, for, for several issues, we're going to key in on just the terrestrial data sets. Um, I really don't feel very comfortable interpolating data, um, especially for the, the aquatic data sets um, when there's only nine taxa involved. Um, and there's also some issues with interpolation of uh, aquatic riverine taxa that we need to get over. Um, and hopefully maybe some people in the room can help us with those issues later on. Um, but for the remainder of the talk, we're going to focus in on the terrestrial and um, data sets for both genetic diversity and divergence values. So how are we going to do this? Um, what we're going to do first is we're going to take each single species and estimate divergence and diversity surfaces. So for that, we need, um, for each location, the latitude, and the longitude, and also genetic estimator value. What are genetic parameters? Um, so for genetic diversity, we have different data sets where we can estimate a value of genetic diversity. For sequence data, we use pairwise nucleotide differences, and for the genotype data, we use expected heterozygosity values. And then for also genetic divergence, we use sequence data. Um, for, for sequence data, we use the absolute average divergence. For genotype data, we use these F statistics that just are measures of divergence. Um, and also for the terrestrial data set, we are really worried about isolation by distance and how distance affects genetic divergence values. So to account for this, we did um, what's called isolation by distance um, analysis. All these values then um, were, were basically converted to a consistent scale, and that's just the statistic divided by the maximum site-specific diversity or divergence values. And when we have all these different numbers, we have to get everything on a, a consistent scale um, um, or it's not going to make any sense. So once we have the latitude, the longitude, and um, the genetic estimator value. Um, we plotted this across the landscape and created triangular irregular networks. Um, and then we use inverse distance weighted interpolation to kind of smooth out the surface. And for those interested, the surfaces were clipped to the extent of the collection locations. So now what we have is a bunch of single, single species surfaces. Um, we're the, the power of this technique um, comes into uh, play when, when we start overlaying multiple species together, uh, overlaying multiple species surfaces. And what we're trying to find are patterns, hotspot patterns. You know, so the more overlay, the more multi-species surfaces we have, the, I feel that the more power the, the, uh, that we have in detecting these um, hotspots of genetic diversity. So what we use is um, we constructed multi-species genetic divergence or diversity surfaces where we average the single species surfaces. And what happens is we put all this into what's called the genetic landscape GIS toolbox down here um, by Vandergast et al. in 2001, or 2011, excuse me. And what happens is this genetic toolbox or the genetic landscape toolbox creates three surfaces, an average surface, which is basically the mean raster surface, a variance surface, which is just looking at the measure of dispersion, and a count surface, which is basically the number of input surfaces that overlap in each cell. So the count surface is going to come into play because we want, we want to make sure we have high counts uh, representing our multi-species genetic diversi divergence or diversity values. The variance is going to come into play because if you can think about it, in areas where there's maybe a, a contact zone or hybridization zone, 
um, certain taxa are going to show high levels of genetic divergence. Other taxa might show uh, low levels of genetic divergence just be due to various isolating mechanisms. So when you look at the average surface for p taxa like that, um, you won't see any hot spots. But the variance should pull out hot spots because some, some values are going to be much larger, some values are going to be much smaller, so you're going to have a high variance. Whereas with the average, you probably have very little, or uh, uh, um, that variance will draw down the average um, raster surface. So how do we identify hot spots? So once we have this multi-species genetic landscape, um, all areas that were greater than 1.5 standard deviations above or below the mean value for that the genetic landscape were quantified as hot spots. Now that 1.5 is somewhat arbitrary, and we tried um, Reviewers, when we published, we tried publishing this, said that that is a very arbitrary value. Um, we could use 1.96 or something, uh, you know, a little more weight behind it. But for now, it's just 1.5 standard deviations. Um, it's what other people have used in the past, so um, that's our justification for it. <clears throat> um, okay, so once we have an idea of our hotspots, what we wanted to do was overlay those hotspots um, on the protected areas database that, and do some type of gap analysis. And so we wanted to know what percent of those hotspots uh, afforded some type of protection um, across that landscape, you know, where protection is these protected areas like national parks, um, wildlife management units, um, national wildlife refuges, things of that nature. All right, so the results. Now you're going to be Remember that the multi-species genetic surface reports three values, a mean surface value, a variant surface value, and a count surface value. So you'll see basically three um, maps. One will be the mean surface, one will be the variance, one will be the count for the terrestrial diversity surface. And then you'll also see three maps for the terrestrial divergence surface. So keep that in mind as we walk through this. All right, so here's the terrestrial diversity data sets. So up in the upper left-hand corner is the mean surface, in the middle is the count surface, and a lower, air, lower right is the variance surface. Um, for the count surface in the middle, you have the scale where green, I, you know, I was told a couple of months ago, and I never changed it, I apologize, this was probably the, the worst slide for a colorblind person. Um, you know, you go through school and you're like, you, you, you learn what colors not to use for your PowerPoint slides. Well, I failed that miserably, so I, I apologize for anyone who's colorblind in the room. We are working on uh, changing the colors, but for now, um, you can see the count surface scale where very, very little count, one, um, is representing green, and a uh, high count surface is represented in 11, uh, uh, represented in red. So if you look at the middle pile here, middle map, you see, you see we have pretty good coverage across the landscape in the middle of uh, the surface, but on the periphery, we have very low counts. Um, that's going to become a, a conundrum for us later on, um, so keep this in mind. Um, so let's look at the mean surface here. So anything outlined in white, like notice here up in um, North Carolina, also around the Atlanta area, there's, it's red and then highlighted in white or ordered in white, those are 1.5 standard deviations above the median, and those are our hot spots. All right, so we have a, a huge hot spot of genetic diversity. That means the values of genetic diversity are much larger um, here than anywhere else across the landscape. So in North Carolina, we have a hot spot of genetic diversity. Um, here at the North Carolina-Virginia border, also another hot spot of uh, genetic diversity. And down here we have several small hotspots of genetic diversity. Uh, and down here at the interface of southern Georgia and the Panhandle of Florida, another hotspot of genetic diversity. However, if you look at the count surface, and that's the number of um, you know, points involved basically in um, interpreting the, the, these values, if you look at these hot spots over here, they have very low count surfaces. So we have very little faith that this hot spot is probably a true hot spot. Um, whereas if you look up in here where we have maybe six taxa represented in this count surface, 
which represents this area right in here with the mean surface, we're feeling much more comfortable that that might be uh, a hot spot of genetic diversity. All right. And similar down here with the mean surface as well, um, if you look at how it's extrapolated in this area, um, uh, again, oops, sorry, whoa, we're going too fast. Ooh, no, it did There we go. It, 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 it uh, appears to be have a higher count surface than uh, um, maybe four or five tacks involved in that genetic hotspot. Uh, just to give an idea, we do have some um, some hotspots and, and variants in genetic diversity. Um, it's not really important for variants in genetic diversity, so we're, we're just not even going to bother with talking about the variants in genetic diversity. It'll become more important when we look at variants in genetic divergence, which is the next slide. All right, so here's the mean surface, count surface, and various variant surface for the terrestrial, that's isolation by distance, divergence values. Um, so these values being corrected for um, the effects of distance, basically. So again, we have the count surface in the middle. Um, similar pattern where we have high count surface in the middle of the South Atlantic LCC. We're on the periphery of the range. We have um, much smaller count surfaces. Uh, when we look at our hot spots of terrestrial divergence, in red or are the hot spots. Um, here's one in the Panhandle of Florida. Unfortunately, it's represented by a low count surface, as you can see here. Um, here over in um, oh, Georgia, West Georgia, there's a, a large area that is a hot spot. Unfortunately, it is categorized by low count surface as well, so we don't have much faith in that surface being a, a, a true hot spot. The interesting thing that I found was these these cold areas, or cold spots as we can call them, um, areas areas where there's a high level of uh, gene flow occurring, and this occurs um, basically in uh, North Carolina, um, the coast of North Carolina, and extends down into the coast of South Carolina as well. And while the count surface is low um, in the North Carolina portion, the count surface gets uh, a lot higher um, in South Carolina. So we're putting some faith in that we might have a, a cool spot or an area where there's high level of gene flow occurring um, in South Carolina on the coast. Um, also, uh, there are some, some cool spots here in North Carolina, shown in blue, but we have very uh, limited count surface to have any faith in those values as well. Um, interesting, if you look at the variant surface down here at this area in the panhandle of Florida, we do see a hot spot of genetic variance. So that means that um, in terms of genetic divergence, like I said earlier, there's some taxa that are highly divergent in, the, in this area, and there's other taxa that aren't very divergent as, as well. And I'll, I'll explain um, some of that um, coming up in um, the next, well, in, in some slides later on. So it gives you an idea of what the the multi-species surface landscapes look like for terrestrial diversity and divergence. And we're starting to see some patterns. I'll go into some discussion about that in a little bit, but I'd like to talk about the gap analysis. Now, the gap analysis I, I have to point out is, you know, it's a first approximation. It's a rough approximation, given that we had such low count surfaces, especially on the periphery. So what we were calling a hot spot might might be a hot spot if we add more data to it, or it might not be a hot spot. So we, we did the gap analysis incorporating all the hot spots and cool spots, and keeping that in mind that it's just a rough approximation at this time. So for the terrestrial data set, we have several statistics. We have um, basically, so here's, here's the percent of the landscape hotspots. Roughly, we found across the South Atlantic LCC, for mean surface diversity, we found eight point, roughly 8% of the landscape had um, hotspots, and roughly four, well, roughly 5% had a variant hotspot in diversity, um, and also roughly 7% for divergence, and roughly 7% for the variant surface. So how much of this percentage right here in the landscape hotspot is protected. That's the next value for hotspots. So roughly 10% of the mean surface diversity um, values that were located in the South Atlantic LCC were protected. Roughly 4% for the variance, 6% for the mean surface and divergence, 
and roughly 5% for the variance. Um, I was actually shocked at how much, um, especially for the mean surface diversity and mean surface divergence, how much was actually protected. I thought it would be much, much less. Um, so given that this is a you know, first approximation, that, that's pretty good, I would think. You know, we have roughly 10% of those hotspots protected. Um, in terms of landscape school spot, cool spots, we have even more, and that's primarily, we'll talk about why, but that's primarily because a lot of those um, cool spots on the South Carolina and um, North Carolina coast, you know, it's a it's, um, dune environment. A lot of that is protected by National Wildlife Refuges and other um, protected areas. So that, that, in my mind, that's, that's a good, um, good first glance at the level of hotspots, um, the, the level of uh, protection afforded by those um, various um, protected areas in terms of genetic diversity and divergence. Now, um, I think most of the rumors start, may be starting to realize there are some definite caveats with, with what I have presented so far. And remember, this is just a pilot study. We are just really interested in if we could even do this at all. And, you know, I, I, was, I was happy to see that we got um, 16 and 15 data sets for the terrestrial landscape. Um, but if you look at uh, the sampling of populations across the landscape, it's, it's, it's rather sparse. Um, and it gives you an idea of, of some of the, the sampling and the localities uh, for some of the, the uh, organisms that we looked at. You know, as you can see here for the Nate Chorus Frog, you know, here the, the, what's labeled in green are the sampling locations. So, you know, to do this correctly, it would be nice to have this whole South Atlantic LCC just kind of peppered with green dots um, so that you can interpolate the data with some type of confidence. Uh, unfortunately, that's just not the case. Our molecular data sets aren't there yet. Um, but w I think we're, we're getting there. We're, we're seeing more and more um, genetic data sets that are encompassing uh, a larger area within the South Atlantic. Um, um, yeah, like I said, there are low count surfaces. It was interesting that most of the low count surfaces were on the periphery of the uh, South Atlantic LCC, which to me is a, you know, a, a sign that, hey, um, we shouldn't set up these arbitrary boundaries for the, the various LCCs, and we probably should be starting to look at these interfaces. I have, the, I have a feeling in terms of genetic divergence and genetic diversity, it's these interfaces at the boundary zones that are going to be the most interesting spots um, for protection of biodiversity. You know, when we get up into the Appalachians, we have differences in habitat, you know, that are driving differences in local adaptation. Um, so I think, you know, even though we had low count sur counts on the surfaces, I think if we, if we look outside the South Atlantic LCC with our data sets, I think we'd actually see some um, higher levels of count surfaces. So we might want to incorporate that into analyses later on. Um, you know, just a word of caution, surfaces should not be used to identify areas in need of conservation. You know, just for instance, these genetic divergences are based on interpolation at the midpoints. You know, so we are looking at the midpoint value. That genetic divergence or you know, what is causing that genetic divergence, like a barrier gene flow, could happen anywhere along that continuum, um, not just the midpoint. Um, and what that highlights an interesting um, area is when we start seeing these hotspots of genetic diversity and divergence, we might want to go back in and try to collect more data to really figure out, hey, what is driving that genetic divergence value? Is it a, what is that barrier to gene flow? Um, you know, is it something contemporary like a um, uh, you know a roadway or a dam set in place, or is it something more historical um, in nature? Um, and it, obviously, there needs to be more thorough sampling, um, primarily looking at widespread and common species. So if we had to do this right. We definitely want to start choosing our species correctly and try to find ones that are widespread and common um, from throughout the South Atlantic LCC. Having mentioned all these caveats, there were two hot spots that showed low surface, low surface variants and had high taxonomic representation. When I say high ta taxonomic representation, right now it's just greater than four species. And these two areas um, were Panhandle, Florida, and, so and Southern Georgia, and the coastal North and South Carolina. So I'd like to just briefly discuss these two um, areas in more detail. So let's look at the Panhandle of Florida and what we know about that area. Um, you know, 
since the 60s, we've known this is a contact zone for terrestrial and aquatic biota. We know this is a kind of an interesting area. And so we can set up some expectations, given that what we know about contact zones. Um, we, should, we should see varying levels of genetic divergence, um, primarily because what we talked about earlier, we should see species-specific isolated mechanisms or lack thereof, d depending on the species. Um, so we should see um, you know, hot spots of variance in genetic divergence. We should also see greater than average levels of genetic diversity, primarily because in this contact zone, there could be a lot of hybridization, which creates, um, often creates higher levels of genetic diversity than compared to um, the uh, sibling taxa involved. And this is exactly what we found. The, the patterns that we found in the Panhandle of Florida fit these expectations. Um, you know, we see while the, the this hot spot mean divergence um, didn't have a high surface count, we do see this level, these, these areas up here with hot spots of genetic diversity did have um, high count surfaces. So we're starting to see um, you know, hot spot and genetic divergence. We see this variance in genetic divergence as well. And we see this high level of genetic diversity as a hot spot as well. Also, it also is a, an aquatic diversity hotspot, um, which we found um, in, in a lot of our data. This stood out with high count surfaces as well. <clears throat> so uh, let's go on to the next one. The, also of interest is the coastal North and South Carolina. Um, and what we found is that this appears to be a genetic quarter of, of high conductivity. Um, you know, it's maintaining significant levels of genetic variation. And this is really neat. Um, this is the first time that I, you know, I've, I've actually found like a cool spot like this. Now, again, you know, we, there are some caveats involved in it, but it would be really interesting to go back and choose taxa wisely to figure out, okay, here, are, here is, you know, is, does this hold up when we start adding more and more taxa? You know, does this hold up to be a barrier or, or a, a genetic corridor where there's a lot of <laughs> going on? Um, but interesting, this is, you know, this, uh, for most people in the room, they probably know this is the Mid-Atlantic Coastal Plain Ecoregion. Um, it's the top ten in the continent for a number of reptiles, birds, and tree species. Um, so that's really interesting. It has a high level of uh, species biodiversity. Um, it also appears to have a high level of uh, genetic diversity as well. Um, you know, it's comprised of coastal beach and dune ecosystems. And unfortunately, it, has, it does have a substantial number of protected areas with it. So in conclusion, um, you know, I can't stress this enough. You know, I, I feel, feel sometimes um, unfortunate, but this was an initial, initial assessment, uh, a pilot study. But even with this initial assessment, we did identify several regions of interest suggesting that this multi-species approach does show promise um, for estimating um, areas of um, uh, estimating hotspots of genetic divergence and genetic diversity, as well as um, cool spots uh, of genetic divergence. There's definitely need for additional studies. Um, I can't stress this enough, you know, especially for aquatic species. Um, I, think, I think they're going to come on more and more. But the interesting thing is, uh, as people start funding these genetic projects, we should keep in the back of our, our minds that, hey, you know, we can roll up these data and use them and reevaluate them and reanalyze them again in this context. So as, as people are funding these various genetic, um, um, you know, looking at population structure across the landscape for aquatic species or terrestrial species, um, we might want to make sure that their sampling design is adequate um, to represent, um, to, to do further analysis with the, the South Atlantic LCC. Um, um, with that, you know, future directions, I was going to have some bullets here, you know, obviously it all requires money, but it would be really interesting to go back into um, some of these hot spots and, um, and try to extract more data from more tax uh, so that our interpolations are um, much more robust. Um, I definitely would like to roll this out across boundaries and other LCCs um, to really get at, our, you know, are we starting, you know, we saw some hot spots in Georgia, um, right around the Apalachicola, right around the Flint River system. Um, you know, are those real? Are, there, are they not? I'm, I'm guessing if we extend the boundaries, um, we might see those as real hot spots. Um, but, you know, further work needs to be done. Um, I'd love to talk with people about interpolation of data. I have Jason Duke um, 
learning more about that. But there's definitely ways to interpolate data with riverine species um, that might be better off. We use, you know, um, inverse distance weighted, um, but there's other various interpolation methods out there that might be more robust. Um, so I guess with that, yeah, I'll open it up to any questions. I appreciate your time. <laughs> Well, thank you, Greg. I know I speak for the entire group when I, I say thank you again for presenting these initial results. And we have some time now to open it up for any questions that folks might have regarding um, Greg's presentation. And again, all you have to do is press star six, or you can just type a question directly into the chat box um, if you have any. So I'll, I'll let it open up right now for any further discussion. I think you, you wowed him to silence, Greg. Yeah, hey, they're just bored him to death. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I, I heard some folks come in later on during the presentation. I guess I failed to mention it um, in the opening slides, but we did actually record this webinar. So if Mute off. was gracious enough to record it for me, so we that'll be up on our website. Um, yeah, I, I think take some time to, to think about it. It is a lot to take in in, in mm -hmm. a certain amount of time. But uh, feel free to contact me um, with any questions or concerns, or if you'd like to help out with further analyses, um, please let me know. Great. Thanks, Greg. And I, I think your information is on our website, the southatlanticlcc.org, so you can contact them through that or um, sure, email, you know, or pick up the phone. Yeah. Well, before we get off of here, Greg, this is Amy Keister. I just I wanted to thank you for the presentation. It was really helpful for me. And um, you shared your data with me. And I, I haven't put it up on the Conservation Planning Atlas yet because I wasn't exactly sure um, how to, you know, how to caveat it and how to explain mm -hmm. it to people. And so maybe we could work together um, to figure out the best way to share this data with people so they'll know sure. what it is and how to use it. Yeah, that sounds great. Great. Thanks. I think the hard part right now is trying to apply it. Um, you know, what I was hoping for is to have more data across the landscape where we could actually start really going in and looking at barriers to migration, you know, looking at those corridors, feeling comfortable that, yes, in in North Carolina and South Carolina, we definitely have a corridor there that, that might need protecting. Um, you know, unfortunately, that's just not the case at this time. You know, just it's just limited with the number of tax involved. Yeah. Well, maybe we could explore some ways to, yeah, do a gallery on the Conservation Planning Atlas so you can have more of a descriptive explanation of, of what these data are and, and what, what we need in the future and how we can use them as they are. Yeah, that sounds good. Good, good. Uh, Greg, this is, this is John Faustini. I had a, uh, a, a question. This is uh, really interesting stuff. It was a great presentation. Um, but yeah, I get a little nervous when you talk about applying it because it does, I mean, you know, it does seem like you, you really need some more. I mean, you, you're working with a pretty sparse data set, but I don't fully understand because it seems like you had, you have a number of species, but you also have, for some of those, um, you only have a few samples. So like, like, you know, you used only if they had three or was it four or more sites. Yeah. So when you start spatially extrapolating on four sites, and I'm not quite sure how your your tool combines those different because they obviously apply to different areas. How those overlapping areas that 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 I don't quite fully understand. But but I mean, two thoughts that occur to me are um, well, well, one I think you know, wow, that's pretty sparse. So you um, it might be okay to do it in you know to think about that in some place like uh, coastal North Carolina where um, along that corridor you may have a corridor there. I mean, I'm thinking though you have. Uh, if you're not taking into account uh, topography or other factors that might influence flyways, things that might influence genetic uh, uh, yep. spread, that 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 you know, just just assuming it's a, a, a planar surface that everything's spreading out on, um, with no directional influences or geographic constraints, um, is you know, especially is a little dangerous, especially with such sparse data. T totally agree. Um, you know, like I said, it, it would be it would be much better if we could go and have 
you know, ideal sampling design going into um, the, what, a presumed corridor there in North Carolina, South Carolina now. So I, I guess this is, this is an area maybe to focus some efforts perhaps more so. You know, if, if we're starting to see this pattern, you know, maybe it's a pattern, maybe it's not, but, you know, do we want to focus more effort into develop a, a better sampling design to go out and figure out, yeah, does this, does this pattern really exist or not? Um, you know, the, the I, getting back to, to some of your question, you know, the power of this is this multi-species approach. You know, so the more species that you overlay on top of each other that show this pattern, is that that pattern might be real. And so it, 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 right. it might be real, you know, so, you know, so that's why I'm, I'm counting you know, where we have high count surfaces, I feel a little bit more comfortable. But again, those high count surfaces are only four or five taxa. So how much how much you really want to put in that data? Yeah, I, I can't stress enough. It was a pilot study. Like you said, you know, there's, there's a lot of caveats there before you go and actually apply this. Um, right. but it, it might help to focus our areas uh, in terms of where we want to put um, you know, more focused effort. I agree. That would be a good way to use use the information. Yeah. Uh, and and also one 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 thing that occurs to me, and I don't know, um, is whether is whether these you know where you have data uh, might be tend to be biased uh, perhaps towards areas that do have higher biodiversity, um, and how that might affect your interpretation. You might be you know mm. you might be having the bar setting the bar kind of high. Uh, for 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 hotspot because your data are already focused on areas that have unusually high biodiversity because that's where people want to sample possibly that, just a thought yeah well again it was hope uh, we, you know the hopeful was you know the, the thing out of that that we were hoping for was you know okay we'll just just find as many taxes as possible yeah now if all those taxes are, are biased or some are, yeah, then, then you're totally right. It could be biased in the results to some degree. Um, given the taxa involved in that list, a lot of them, I'm guessing that's probably not the case, but yeah, it's, it's something to look for in more detail. Obviously, a random sampling design is, is what's needed. Um, and, you know, before we went in that direction, we wanted to see what was out there across the landscape. Yeah, right? Thanks, John. Thank you, Greg. Yeah, this is this is Rue. Another thing I was going to mention about this project that Greg and, and John and I talked about in the beginning is sort of knowing that, yeah, this is going to be a pilot, and we didn't really know how much was going to be out there. Um, they spent a little, you know, a little extra time than you normally would on a project like that, <clears throat> trying to really, you know, capture the code, document the processes um, for times when we may have some better you know, more better structured samples, more better designed additional studies, because as genetic sampling seems to be really exploding now, um, one of the great things that ended up Greg and John others sort of did is really try to set the stage for being able to repeat some of this stuff without having to start from scratch um, if and when we get some, some additional data, which was pretty nice. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, as, as genetic data becomes cheaper and quicker to collect, you know, John Robinson, like you said, provided Rue with all the codes to go from, you know, all the, all the genetic data is um, housed in genetic repositories called GenBank. So, you know, if the genetic data is put there in the correct way, you can just basically data mine um, from GenBank, um, go through the various analyses and various programs, and then and put it into ArcGIS and uh, use this toolkit. So there's a lot of code involved. Um, there's some caveats in the code as well, but we're not going to go into that right now. But it is set up to streamline as these data set, as these genetic data sets become um, more and more um, prevalent in the South Atlantic LCC. And Greg, we had one more question come over through the chat box before we move into some of the SARLCC updates, and it's from Christine Ellis, and they state, I'd like to see some of this data being used to support the continuation of the conservation tax incentives. Is there an opportunity to summarize these data to show the success of the conservation efforts in North Carolina relative to the high levels of conservation there? 
Hmm. Well. Okay, we're we're. Um. Well, so the report's out. I guess that's the first place to start. Um. Lori is to to maybe extract some of the data from that. If she's really interested in, is it just North Carolina? Did I, did I hear that correctly? Yeah, it was focused on North Carolina. The um, she can contact me, um, General. Uh, but again, I, I like we said with with John. You know, I, I hate to extrapolate things um, beyond what mm. what I can. You know, this is a pilot study. I, I don't know if we really want to start looking at. How does this actually relate to um, things in North Carolina at this time? But the report is is out, and I think it's on the website. And that's where the data are. Um, and also, you know, feel free to contact me to discuss it further. It's, the report is out, and I believe you wrote a really nice summary um, of the report back in March or so on our website, so folks can find more information on our website um, and a great summary that you put together for us. Okay, well, I think, Greg, thank you so much for presenting today. I really appreciate it and really enjoyed your presentation. And again, folks, we recorded it, so if you missed any of it, um, you'll be able to find it on our site. And, Greg, I am going to steal back the power so you'll stop sharing your desktop, and we'll just do some quick highlights and updates from the South Atlantic uh, Network. Great. Thank you, Lori. Yeah, no problem. Thank you again, Chris. Greg, sorry, I'm looking at another name. <laughs> All right. So some brief SILCC updates. Um, our next web forum will be reporting back on the results and next steps from the Blueprint Workshop. So when I was looking at the presenter uh, list, uh, the participation list, sorry, I'm losing my words, um, I saw a number of folks who were present at our uh, recently hosted wor workshops in Raleigh and Savannah, and Will will be reporting back on those workshops um, on December 19th at 10 a.m. And Rua, I'm going to hand it over to you to give a brief uh, overview of what went on during those workshops. Sure. So, um, so we just finished up, and I've been doing a blog post every month on, on what's going on in the workshops. There'll be another wrap-up in this December newsletter. Um, but basically, we had some really great attendance, uh, about 180 or so people so far. We're still kind of crunching the final numbers to see. Um, but a whole mess of folks, really good diversity across the different workshops. Um, so that went really well. Um, so the next steps, we're going to be getting out um, fairly soon some of the results from the workshops for you to explore up on the Conservation Planning Atlas, sort of look at some of the places folks selected and conservation actions and some of the comments. Um, and then leading up to, in January, a, um, an integrated draft uh, based on the workshop results and some further uh, quantitative testing based on South Atlantic indicators and crosswalking to existing conservation plans. Uh, so you hear more about that in the upcoming December newsletter. Lord, I think you're on mute. I'm on <laughs> mute. I'm talking to myself. <laughs> I can hear you over there. Okay, I, I know that Ken McDermott, our, our coordinator, wanted to say a few words on the next steps for implementation <laughs> following the workshops. <laughs> Ken's on mute. <laughs> Everyone's on mute today. All right, I was just looking at my mute light. Sorry about that. Um, I just want to give you a little heads up as as um, everybody's been working hard, both uh, folks on the phone who have been at workshops and the staff here, um, and and. Uh, developing and building this blueprint that's that's uh, due um, in March, we're also thinking about what's next. And uh, our steering committee has asked uh, us to be thinking about how do we quickly move from um, version one of the blueprint to some specific efforts to facilitate implementing the conservation actions that uh, will be highlighted by that blueprint. So we'll, we're starting to embark upon a, an effort to uh, develop some criteria and think about how we might, uh, what might be really important things to demonstrate the value of the, of the, of the uh, blueprint and the cooperative of the forum um, of all the different organizations that are engaged so that we can make some uh, important steps forward in showing the value and re relevance of the cooperative and of the blueprint. So the reason why I want to let you know that is that, that first off, that we've always said this isn't a, this isn't just a plan for to sit on the shelf and look at it every once in a while. It's actually something that we hope.
hope as a cooperative and the staff to help everybody out there um, find ways that we can begin to implement this and show the power. So we will be looking for, um, in the near future, some feedback um, from folks in our uh, web community and, and otherwise out there to provide some feedback back to to the staff and to the uh, steering committee about your ideas for what might be uh, valuable ways to begin to start implementing um, the blueprint, whether it's in some sort of initiative, um, geographic focus, or, or just a variety of different ways. So I just wanted to give you a heads up about that, what, that we're thinking about that, and we'll be um, be contacting you through a newsletter or a web forum or some way in the near future to um, ask for your help with that. And that's it. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for participating in another great Third Thursday web forum. A big round of virtual applause for Greg um, on his great presentation on genetic hotspots throughout the South Atlantic region. And I just wanted to remind folks again that there's numerous opportunities to get involved with USALCC. Um, we run a very active web community where you can find upcoming events, projects, project highlights, and uh, a whole area dedicated to the conservation blueprint, which Rua and Ken just mentioned. Um, so again, I wanted to thank everybody for their participation, and I uh, hope to see you at the next uh, web forum in um, December. So thanks, everybody, for, for uh, participating, and hope you all have a great day.